Hi everyone. Thank you for joining me for this presentation on fluid dynamics and liquids production in the BC Central Montney. My name is Jeffrey Horton and I'm an engineer with Canadian Discovery. Today we're going to be looking at how liquid yields in the Montney are driven by pressure and temperature trends, geology, and completion designs. We will begin by providing some background information on regional hydrodynamics trends in the Montney and describing how temperature, pressure, thermal maturity, and gas chemistry are related to phase boundaries in liquids production. Then we'll discuss some issues with condensate reporting in the public data and how the new BC Total Production Report solves this issue by providing plant liquids allocated back to producing wells. Then we'll investigate the main variables that affect liquids production in the BC Montney from Septimus to Swan and see which variables are most relevant in different plays within the study area. And finally, we will be looking at completion designs to test whether higher completion intensities result in higher liquids yields, and whether operators use different stimulations in the liquids-rich areas compared to the drier areas. First, some background information on liquids reporting and the new BC Total Production Report. A major issue with analyzing liquids production in the Montney is the inconsistent reporting of condensate production in the public data. This diagram is taken from AER Directive 17 and illustrates the two ways in which condensate can be reported. In the first scenario, when condensate is sold directly from the field, it gets reported as a liquid volume in the public data. But if the condensate is mixed with the gas stream and transported for further processing, as in the scenario shown on the right, the condensate volume is reported as a theoretical gas equivalent volume, and this conversion is different from the familiar 6 to 1 MCF per BOE calculation. To illustrate the significance of this reporting issue, we're going to show production data for two operators and compare the volumes reported in the company's financial reports, shown in the bars on the left for each quarter, to the public data, shown on the right. For Birchcliff, the reported oil volumes are similar in the two data sets, but the company reports significant natural gas liquids volumes in their financial statements, but higher gas in the public data. Similarly, Seven Generations report significantly more condensate and natural gas liquids in their financial statements, with larger gas volumes in the public data. The bar chart on the right shows the total liquids production rate within the study area from 2010 to 2020. The plant C2 through C5 volumes come from the new BC Total Production Report. We can see that without this new data set, liquids production would be significantly underrepresented. Next, we'll provide an overview of hydrodynamics in the Montney before diving deeper into our study area. The Montney is a complex hydrodynamic system with variable reservoir quality, multiple source rocks, and complex structural history. The map on the left illustrates how the Montney is comprised of higher permeability conventional reservoirs to the east and a lower permeability deep basin system to the west, with turbidites in higher permeability areas near the BC Alberta border. Sometimes hydrocarbons are internally sourced, and other times have migrated from zones like the Doig or Nordeg. The map on the right shows the structural complexity of the Montney. Structure impacts hydrocarbon trapping and fluid migration and depth will affect temperatures and pressures. This presentation will focus on the deep basin Montney just west of the BC Alberta border. Pressure and temperature are perhaps the two most important variables for predicting liquids yield within the overpressured deep basin area of the Montney. Phase windows are strongly correlated with T max. And by relating Tmax to present day temperature, we can identify key isotherms that define the transition between the oil, wet gas, and dry gas windows. These key isotherms are 60, 85, and 104 degrees Celsius for the South Montney, and 53, 69, and 83 degrees Celsius for the North Montney. The SPE paper on the screen has a detailed discussion of this workflow for identifying key isotherms. And now, let's dive into our study area from Septimus to Swan. Here is a map of the study area and a bar chart with IP90 rate distributions for each operator and play. The areas are sorted from northwest to southeast. Let's go through these areas and make some preliminary observations. In the northwest, 
Septimus is the shallowest area with the lowest temperatures, but high pressure gradients. CNRL reports significantly more C2 and C3 volumes compared to other operators. The plays with the highest liquids rates and yields are Ovintiv's wells at Tower and Arc's wells at Parkland. To the southeast at Sunrise, Ovintiv and Termaline are getting lower liquids yields, but some of the gas rates are so high that these wells can still produce up to 500 barrels per day. As we move further to the southeast, liquids yields tend to be low, with the exception of Ovintiv's wells at Briar Ridge. In the following slides, we're going to look at liquids yields and rates on some maps, and we're going to focus on the production of heavier liquids, including oil, field condensate, and plant C5. Lighter components, specifically C2 through C4, are typically a minor component of the total liquids, with the exception of CNRL at Septimus and Ovintiv at Sunrise. We believe that the higher C2 through C4 volumes are more heavily influenced by differences in operating conditions at the processing plants. And by focusing on the heavier liquids, we should get a more fair comparison between areas. Next, we'll take a closer look at how pressure and temperature affect liquid yields. Temperature increases from north to south, and the green, orange, and red lines indicate the key isotherms that signal the transitions between oil, wet gas, and dry gas. The pressure gradient increases from northeast to southwest. All wells in the study area are within the overpressured deep basin, with pressure gradients above 10 kPa per meter. With the yield map on the right, we see that most of the green dots with the highest liquids yields are concentrated at Tower and Parkland. Yields decrease dramatically as we move down dip toward the deeper, warmer areas including Ground Birch, Sunset, and Swan. We divided the study area into three sub-areas, labeled West, Central, and East on the map. The West is characterized by lower temperatures and higher pressures, while the East is characterized by higher temperatures and lower pressures. Next we'll examine these pressure and temperature relations within each of these three areas. Now we're going to look at the pressure and temperature data graphically. The graphs on the top row show liquids yields, while the graphs on the bottom show liquids rates. Note that the y-axis is reversed so that higher pressures are on the lower side of the graph. The geothermal gradient ranges from 30 degrees Celsius per 1,000 meters of depth in the west to 34 degrees in the east. The lines indicate the combinations of pressures and temperatures associated with each pressure gradient. In the west, we have a few wells with high liquids yields at temperatures below 63 degrees Celsius at Septimus, shown in the yellow, and the yield drops to 5 to 25 barrels per million cubic feet at higher temperatures, shown in the orange. As the pressure gradient increases above 13 kPa per meter at ground birds, liquids yields drop to less than 5 barrels per million cubic feet. So while temperatures are favorable in the west area, it appears that the higher pressures are resulting in lower liquids yields. The central area is where we tend to see the highest yields and rates. Liquids yields are highest in the oil window, with temperatures below 69 degrees Celsius, but yields are relatively high in the wet gas window as well, including wells with pressure gradients above 13 kPa per meter. This is where we see some of the highest rates in terms of barrels per day, because the gas rates tend to be much higher compared to the oil window. In the east area, the wells are on average deeper and have much higher temperatures. While we still have wells within the wet gas window with pressure gradients of 10 to 13 kPa per meter at Dawson, these liquid yields are considerably lower compared to the central areas under similar temperatures and pressures. So far we've seen that pressure and temperature, along with pressure gradients and geothermal gradients, are reasonable predictors of liquid yields but there are a few areas such as Septimus and Dawson that don't quite fit the trend. Next, we're going to look at some of the other factors affecting liquid yields, starting with thermal maturity and gas chemistry. The ratio of IC4 to NC4 is considered to be a robust indicator of thermal maturity. The ratio increases as heavier hydrocarbons are cracked to lighter components. This ratio is inversely related to the C2 plus wet gas index, defined as the fraction of hydrocarbons with carbon numbers of 2 or greater divided by the total hydrocarbon fraction. The C2 plus wet gas index is correlated with liquid yields, as shown in the bottom row of graphs, and is often used as a proxy for liquids content when the liquids data are not reported. Previous research in the Montney has demonstrated the existence of higher permeability pathways 
that allow methane to travel up dip from deeper, drier areas to shallower zones. A method to detect secondary gas migration is by plotting the ratio of IC4 to NC4 versus the C2 plus wet gas index, as shown in the top row of graphs. Most wells in the west and central areas fall on a similar trend line, but in the east area, several wells at Swan and Dawson have shifted to the left of the trend line, indicating that methane has migrated from drier areas and lowered the C2 plus wet gas index. This explains why liquids yields at Dawson were low despite the wells being in favorable pressure and temperature ranges for liquids production. In the bottom row of graphs, we see that Tower and Parkland have the highest C2 plus wet gas index. At Septimus, liquids yields are relatively low until the wet gas index increases above 0.2. Up to this point, we have been looking at liquids yields on two-dimensional maps, but in reality, operators are targeting multiple zones within the Montney that have variable geology and reservoir quality. Canadian Discovery divides the Montney into upper, upper middle, lower middle, and lower zones. The upper Montney, shown in green, is the dominant zone for all operators, and the lower middle Montney is a common secondary target in some areas, and operators occasionally drill the upper middle or lower Montney. The upper Montney tends to have better reservoir quality than the lower middle Montney in most areas, but in some areas the lower middle Montney has higher liquids yields. The three graphs on this page show IP90 liquids rates versus IP90 gas rates for Ovintive at Tower, Tourmaline at Sunrise, and Arc at Dawson. In these areas, the lower middle Montney, shown in red, has consistently higher liquids yields than the upper Montney. Secondary gas migration is the most likely explanation at Sunrise and Dawson, while reservoir quality appears to be the driving factor at Tower. Completion design is the last variable we're going to investigate in this analysis. We wanted to test whether operators use different completion designs depending on liquids content, and whether higher intensity completions result in higher liquids yields. Plug and perf is the dominant technology in this area, and is used by all operators except tourmaline, which prefers ball and seat completions. The graph on the left shows prop and tonnage per stage versus stage spacing for all wells in the study area. The ratio of tonnage to spacing indicates the completion intensity in terms of prop and tonnage per meter of lateral length. The colors indicate liquids yields. Generally, we see that the wells with higher liquids yields in green tend to have higher completion intensities than the drier wells in red, although there are many exceptions to this trend. The graph on the right shows representative completion designs by operator and area. ARC, in red, uses a higher completion intensity of 2 tons per meter at Parkland compared to 1.2 tons per meter in the less liquids-rich areas of Dawson and Sunrise. Ovintiv's completions at Briar Ridge buck the trend with completion intensities of 3 tons per meter compared to 2 tons per meter at the more liquids-rich Tower area. We wanted to test whether operators can achieve better liquids yields by using higher completion intensities. We decided to use Ovintiv's wells at Tower as a case study. Ovintiv targets multiple zones within the upper and lower middle Montney. We manually assigned target zones for the 200 wells in this area by comparing horizontal well surveys to vertical logs. The most liquids rich zones are in zone 6, in the lower middle Montney, and zone 5, at the base of the upper Montney. The graphs show liquid yields versus completion intensity for each zone. Wells are colored by completion design based on perforation cluster spacing and prop and tonnage per cluster. Overall, we do not find a compelling correlation between liquid yield and completion intensity in any of the zones. However, we notice that Aventive tends to use the higher completion intensity with 8 meter cluster spacing and 21 tons per cluster in zones 5 and 6 with the highest liquid yields. These observations may seem somewhat paradoxical, but we need to keep in mind that the higher completion intensities do tend to achieve higher production rates, and the higher capital costs may be easier to justify in the more liquids-rich zones. And now, for concluding remarks. Let's review the key observations made in this analysis. Septimus has the lowest temperatures, which should favor liquids production, but the liquids yield drops as temperature increases above 63 degrees Celsius. While ground birch falls in the wet gas window, 
Production is relatively dry due to the high pressure gradient. Tower and Parkland have the highest liquids yields and rates. At Tower, Aventive is using higher completion intensities in the lower, more liquids rich target zones. Termaline and Arc are getting higher liquids yields in the lower middle Montney compared to the upper Montney near Dawson. We saw evidence of secondary gas migration in the upper Montney near Dawson and Swan. Oventive is getting high gas rates at Sunrise and Briar Ridge and significant liquids production despite the lower yields. At Sunset and Swan, temperatures are too high for these areas to have any meaningful liquids production. I'd like to thank my colleagues at Canadian Discovery for their work on this presentation. Much of this presentation is based on Allison's previous work on hydrodynamics in the Montney, and Chris worked on the regional stratigraphy and manually assigning target zones for the case study. Lena and Svetlana helped with the graphics and formatting of this presentation. Hopefully I've been able to answer all of your questions in the GeoConvention chat features, but feel free to send me an email for longer, more in-depth questions. Thanks again for your time in attending this presentation. I hope you found the information valuable.